In this segment, we are going to look at our first graph algorithms, depth first search and breadth first search. Let us start by talking about what kinds of problems these algorithms can solve. Some of the most basic questions about a graph are about connectivity. Is the graph connected? That is, is there a path between any two vertices in the graph? We could also ask about two particular vertices. Are they connected? Or what is the set of all vertices that can be reached from vertex zero? We can use depth or breadth first search to answer these kinds of questions. When we talk about the vertices of a graph that can be reached from vertex zero, we are talking about what is known as a connected component. A connected component is a subset S of vertices such that, first of all, it's connected. That is, for any two vertices, U and V, in the set S, there is a path between U and V. And secondly, this is a maximal connected set. Or in other words, for any vertex V, which is not in the set S, that means that V is not connected to any vertex in S. That is the definition of a connected component. So this graph here has two connected components. One is the subset of vertices 0 through 5, and the other one consists of vertices 6, 7, and 8. In general, the connected components of a graph will always partition the vertices. That is, distinct connected components are disjoint subsets, and every vertex is in some connected component. Finding the connected components of a graph is a very basic problem, because usually our algorithms work on each connected component separately. So our algorithm will process one connected component and then move on to process the next connected component, etc. That's what will be important to be able to identify the connected components of a graph. And this is something that we can do with depth or breadth first search. In this segment, we're going to go over the depth first search algorithm. Here we have an example of a maze. We enter the maze at the red arrow and we want to find a path out of the maze at the green arrow. We can map this problem to a graph problem. The vertices of the graph are the branch points of the maze, the locations where there is a decision to be made about which direction to go in. The edges of the graph are given by the corridors of the maze between branch points. So here I have labeled the branch points of the maze. Notice that I did not label all the turns of the maze. If at that turn there was not a choice about which direction to go in. And here we have the graph representing the maze. So in the graph problem, we want to find out if vertex 0 is connected to the exit, which is vertex 15. So this is a connectivity problem. And of course, if vertex 0 is connected to vertex 15, then we also want to find a path between them. We want to find a path out of the maze. We can solve this problem with depth first search. And in fact, depth first search corresponds to a very natural method you might use to find your way out of a maze if you had a long piece of string and some chalk. So first you tether your string to the start of the maze, and then you begin exploring the maze. Anytime you come to a branch point, you follow a corridor that has not already been marked. And every time you take a corridor at a branch point, you mark it as explored with your piece of chalk. When you reach a dead end or a branch point where all corridors have already been marked, then you use the string to retrace your steps back to the previous branch point. And then you just keep repeating this process. OK, so you can see how we might explore the maze following the strategy. And this strategy is actually very similar to what is done in depth first search. Let's go ahead and jump into the code for depth first search. We are first going to look at a recursive version of depth first search, which is beautifully simple to code. At the Godbolt link, you can see this code working on our maze graph here. For this code, we are using the adjacency list representation of the graph. 
As promised, you see that the only way we access the graph is via iterating over the neighbors of a given vertex. In this for loop here, we're just iterating over all the neighbors of vertex V. So here we have an auxiliary array of booleans, which is called marked. And this is initialized to be everywhere false. When we run DFS on a vertex V, then we mark it. Uh, that, that is, we set the Vth entry of this array to be true. And we also check if a vertex is marked before we run DFS on it. So that's this if condition here. We only run DFS on U if U is not already marked. Doing this ensures that we run DFS on each vertex at most once. Now the path that depth first search is going to take to explore a graph depends on the order in which vertices are enumerated in this for loop. So that means that it's going to depend on the particular representation of the graph as an adjacency list. Okay, it's not a property of just the graph itself. It depends on the representation of the graph. Changing the rep representation can change the search path. So when we look at examples of depth first search, it's always important to explicitly talk about the representation that we're using. Let's look at an example of depth first search at work. It's going to take some time to trace through the whole algorithm. So I don't want to use as an example, this maze graph with 16 vertices. So here's a smaller example with just six vertices that we're going to look at. I've explicitly given the adjacency list representation of the graph that we're going to use in this example. And you can follow along with the running of this at the given Godbolt link. So the marked array is initialized to be everywhere false. And we're going to look at the running of DFS on input vertex zero. Okay, here we go. So in the call to DFS of zero, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to mark vertex zero as true. Okay, so you see I've already done that in the marked array there. We then move on to the for loop. So you see that in our adjacency list, the first vertex that we're going to encounter in this for loop on vertex zero is vertex one. This is the first neighbor listed in the adjacency list for vertex zero. So then we move on to the if statement. Uh, and vertex one is not marked. So then we're going to call DFS on vertex one. Okay, so now we're in the call to DFS with vertex one. The first thing that we're going to do is to mark vertex one as true. So I've already done that in the array there. Then we move on to the for loop. And in the adjacency list for vertex one, the first vertex that we encounter is vertex five. So we check if vertex five is marked. It's not. So then we execute DFS on vertex five. Okay, so now we're in the call to DFS with vertex five. Again, the first thing that we do is mark vertex five. I've already done that in the array, marked array there. Then we move on to the for loop with vertex five. And the first vertex that we encounter in the adjacency list for vertex five is vertex four. Now vertex four is not marked. So we go ahead and call DFS on vertex four. So now we're in the call to DFS with vertex four. Um, we mark vertex four as true. Then we go to the for loop. And the first vertex that we encounter in the adjacency list for vertex four is vertex five. So now something slightly different happens, right? Vertex five is already marked. Okay, so we don't do anything with the vertex five. We skip it, we continue the for loop, and then we get to vertex three. Now vertex three is not marked. So now we go ahead and call DFS on vertex three. Okay, so now we're in the call to DFS with vertex three. We go ahead and mark vertex three as true. 
And then we go into the for loop, iterating over the neighbors of vertex 3. The first vertex we encounter is vertex 4, but that is already marked, so we skip it. And then we encounter vertex 2. Now, vertex 2 is not marked, so we go ahead and call DFS on vertex 2. So now we mark vertex 2, and now you can see that the marked array is everywhere true. So now we've already marked all vertices. So that's going to mean that we're not going to call DFS again. Now what we're going to do is just unravel all of these recursive calls. OK, so we're going to cycle through all of the neighbors of vertex 2 in this for loop. But we're not going to do anything because they're all marked. OK, so we're just going to cycle through all the neighbors of vertex 2. And then the call to DFS on vertex 2 actually terminates. So you can see in the picture that we called DFS 2 from DFS 3. You can see that by this arrow from vertex 3 pointing to vertex 2. So now we're going to recall, uh, return to the call of DFS with vertex 3. And we continue in the for loop, cycling through the neighbors of vertex 3. So we already executed the for loop with vertex 2. We're going to move on to do the for loop with vertex 0. But of course, vertex 0 is already marked, so we don't do anything. And the call to DFS on vertex 3 also terminates. So again, by looking at the picture of the graph, you can see that we called DFS on vertex 3 from DFS on vertex 4. So now we return to the call of DFS on vertex 4. A similar thing happens here. We're just going to finish cycling through all of the neighbors of vertex 4. We're not going to do anything because they're all already marked. And the call to DFS on vertex 4 also terminates. That's going to bring us back to the call of DFS on vertex 5. We finish cycling through all the neighbors of vertex 5. And the call to DFS on vertex 5 also returns. Then we go to the call of DFS on vertex 1. So the same thing happens. This call terminates. And that brings us back to the call of DFS on vertex 0. We finish cycling through the neighbors of vertex 0. And finally, the algorithm terminates. And that's the end. Now let's make some observations about the algorithm. The first claim is that running depth-first search on vertex v will mark exactly the vertices in the connected component of V. So there are two parts to showing this. The first part is that any vertex that we mark is actually connected to V. And this follows because we start out at V and we mark V initially, and then we only visit neighbors of vertices that are already marked. The second part of the claim is that we will mark every vertex in the connected component of V. Now, suppose that this were not true. So suppose that after the algorithm finishes, there are some unmarked vertices in the connected component of V. Then we have a picture like I've drawn here in the, in the bottom left. Say that the white vertices are marked and the pink vertices are unmarked. But then there must be a vertex u that is marked but has an unmarked neighbor. And this gives a contradiction. As u is marked, we must have run DFS on u. And then in the for loop, in this call to DFS on vertex u, we would have called DFS on every neighbor of u that is unmarked. OK, so we would have called DFS on this unmarked neighbor of U, and then we would have marked that neighbor. So we've arrived at a contradiction, and this cannot happen. Now let us look at the time complexity of depth-first search in the adjacency list model. We have already commented that marking vertices when we call DFS on them ensures that we call DFS on a vertex at most once, 
because we have this guard there in the if statement that we only run DFS on an unmarked vertex. Now let us look at the amount of time that we spend in the call to DFS on a vertex U. <laughs> so basically the only work that we do in this call is in the for loop where we iterate over the neighbors of U. And we know that in the adjacency list model, iterating over the neighbors of a vertex can be done in time proportional to the degree of that vertex. So the total time we spend running depth first search is proportional to the sum of the degrees of all the vertices that we visit. And this sum is simply twice the number of edges in the connected component of V. At the beginning of this segment, we mentioned finding all the connected components of a graph. So we can easily do this by wrapping depth first search in another loop. We start at an arbitrary vertex and mark all the vert vertices in its connected component. After doing this, then we search to see if there's still an unmarked vertex. And if we find an unmarked vertex, then we run depth first search on that vertex to find to mark all the vertices in its connected component. And we just keep repeating this until all vertices are marked. The total running time to do this becomes of the order the number of vertices plus the number of edges. By keeping track of the order in which we visit vertices, we can also use depth first search to find paths between vertices, not just if they're connected. And we're going to talk about this more in the next video. We've described a recursive version of the depth first search algorithm here, but we can also give an iterative version by explicitly using a stack data structure instead of using the system stack of function calls as in the recursive version. So here's an example of an iterative version of depth first search that explicitly uses a stack. So you can see in the first line here, we're pushing vertices uh, to the stack. So we haven't given the most efficient iterative version of depth first search here in this code. Uh, we al actually allow a vertex to be pushed onto the stack multiple times. And we do that in order to achieve the same visit order of vertices that we had in the recursive version of depth first search. And you can actually see that in this Godbolt link here, you can see this code work and that will actually visit vertices in exactly the same order as we did in the recursive version of depth first search.